But anyhow, Susan has delivered her conference title today at the New Zealand Minerals Forum, the title being Global Warming and Transitional Engineering. What, what do we do? So we prevailed on Susan to uh, virtually repeat the presentation she gave earlier in the day to the Minerals Forum. And hence, that is the title of her talk, and I have much pleasure in thanking Susan for coming to Dunedin at our request for her presentation earlier in today and her offering to give us a repeat, or essentially a repeat her presentation here this evening. Susan Crumdeck. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what, a couple weeks ago, I got an email? <laughs> we, we're in. Okay. Um, and we want you to give the same presentation to the miners, the coal miners and the oil and the gas, and, as you give to the people who are going to come out, you know, and, and, and learn about these evil miners trying to, to rip up our fossils. <laughs> right. So this is an interesting... Um, question. I've never been asked to do something like that before. Um, so if, given that they want to repeat, I'm going to picture you guys as the miners, and you don't look quite like them, I have to say. <laughs> but uh, the introduction was interesting. It was, um, uh, well, we have Professor Susan Crumdike from Canterbury University here, and um, this group wise response hounded us and so we let her come. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, I haven't had a, a uh, yeah, no pressure, fine. So she's going to convince us about climate change or something. Okay. All right. Well, are you ready? Here we go. Trying to get into the, into the mood of speaking to minors. And the challenge, I think, is what do we, what do we actually do now? Right? That, is there, I know there's one side, the fellas out there that we all had to push through in a scrum to get in, yeah, there's, there's that side. And then there's this side, which is, well, the economy needs to keep working. We're just doing what people want. Um, we're just giving people jobs, yeah? So we've got these sort of two things. We want you to stop what you're doing. We can't stop what we're doing. Is there a place in the middle? And that place, I think, looks like the thing that we can probably all agree on, the future is not going to be like the past. And it turns out that this morning, before my talk, I heard in just about every talk that sentiment. We are at a transition point. And if the miners are saying that we're going to transition, that's an interesting new thing. <laughs> now, a uh, fellow from Bath Bathurst did say... Um, we, we know we're at this point of transition. We know um, that things have to change. And yet there's this big black hole where that is. We don't know what to do. Okay? Now, I don't know if he was making a joke about big black holes and coal or something. But, <laughs> but that's, that's sort of where we're at. So my, pro, um, my perspective here is that there, there has to be a middle ground where we go forward and we figure out what to do, or we really are sunk and the positions we're taking don't matter because we won't have gotten to a future point that we want to get to. So how do we engineer the transition? My thesis is that we need a new economics and a new perspective. And so I'm not going to really talk about climate change, in fact. Um, I'm not going to talk about the emission scenarios that the IPCC has come up with and how this purple one that's on the bottom there is what the entire world has agreed to try and achieve so that we can stay somewhere under um, 1.5 degrees because we've already agreed this before. Back in the 1990s, the world agreed and New Zealand signed on in the, something called the Kyoto Protocol that we were going to reduce emissions substantially below 2009 levels by 2012, and we did not do that. We didn't even come close. 
So I don't think that anybody's really that worried about these agreements and these targets that the world sets because they don't actually change anything. Um, it would be good if we could figure out how to meet that target, um, for sure. But actually, all of the countries that have signed on have said, okay, here's what we're going to do, and it doesn't meet that target. It's, it's somewhere over it, maybe even close to three um, degrees warming. And in fact, the things that we are already doing, which we don't seem to have a plan to change, are taking us upwards of five degrees global warming, and that, there is no science that says that's not a disaster for us, and not, not to mention lots of other species. And we've had a new record set. We're, we're moving up, continuing to gain speed, and hit uh, 415 parts per million. I don't know if that means anything to the mining industry, but I'm guessing it doesn't. So that's why I'm not going to talk about climate change, because I don't think there's a point. I also am not going to talk about social justice and social responsibility and taking action because it's not like you're actually arguing against any of that, right? Who's arguing against the sustainable development goals? Oh, Betty? Sure, fine. But go ahead and find a parameter in that set of sustainable development goals that has anything to do with my industry of mining. What precludes me from doing my job? Nothing. So I don't think we really need to talk about that. And while protests are fun, <laughs> I don't think we really need to talk about that either. So there's more protesters. You know, if the local people want to say no to a particular development, that is their right, and they can stand up and say no. And we're fine with that. It's just one of the risks of doing business if you're in the extraction industry. So I don't really want to talk about that either. And um, the other thing, uh, my area is energy, so I am going to focus on energy, is that I'm not going to talk to you about alternatives and renewables, because I know you understand data. And the data I'm showing you here is reality. It's the actual data of oil, the green one on the bottom, ironically, um, gas, the red one, nuclear, um, hydro, nice blue one, and coal. That is the actual data of world production of energy. Now, if you Googled world energy, you would see lots of interesting articles about wind and solar, and we're going to do that. And um, that's all of the wind, solar, biofuel, geothermal together, combined, all together. That data tells me that that transition because we're going to substitute renewables is not a factual thing. And that's unfortunate, but it's true. Why do I think that? They're growing. Yeah, they're growing. Look how fast they grew in 2016. 53 million barrels of oil equivalent growth in renewables. Compare that to the numbers you see there for oil and for gas. Nuclear, okay, a bit more hydro, and a decline in coal, yes, <laughs> which wasn't that much bigger than the, yeah, you see where I'm going? We're losing this battle. And so you don't really have anything to worry about from renewables, <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about that. What I do want to talk about is uh, something that's easy to understand, and that's a little bit of mathematics. Um, growth is... Uh, a thing that, you know, that's what you're supposed to do, right, is grow. But let's, let's just look at it for a minute. Uh, my, the argument was that the future isn't going to be like the past. Well, if the future is like the past, then the growth would continue uh, indefinitely. Let's look at um, what it looks like to have a 2% growth in your business year on year for 50 years and 2% inflation on the cost of your energy. If you're a company that ships things, you have freight costs. Let's say your freight costs are $3,000. If you use the little formula that I've shown you there, and you look into the future using that formula, that's the formula for exponential growth. And you can see what happens. What happens is that in 20 years, you will double the price because you were increasing um, by 2%. And uh, in 50 years, that price gets to something that well, you can't even make sense of it because right now it costs 3000 and in 50 years it'll cost 20000 and you go, well, that's a little too far ahead for me to think, so you move on. Now, the cumulative sum of all that cost, 
just turns out is uh, shy of half a million dollars. Okay, there's some interesting, is that really going to continue? And that's where, you know, um, probably not. Every time there's been a period of growth, and we've had 2% growth in demand in New Zealand, and the government thought it would go on forever, a growth in, in uh, electricity, and in fact it did not go on forever. It stalled, and, the, and the, uh, the industry is trying to figure out what to do about that. Why is electricity demand stalled as of about 2007, and why has it been dropping for the last few years? Good question, because that doesn't fit our model. The model is the problem. Economics, this is what it looks like planning for the future using classical economics. It's called future blindness. And it's there in the maths. We got any mathematicians? Can you, can you uh, look at that mathematical equation and see when I calculate net present value, which is the thing you have to calculate if you want to decide is that a good idea, this project that we're going to invest in, you say, okay, well, I want to look at what the net present value is. How do you figure that out? Remember, we just looked 50 years in the future. You take all of those cash flows, you discount them by dividing by one plus what's called the discount rate to the power of time minus the initial cost of the project. Let's see what that looks like. Here's the thing I just talked to you about. You've got a shipper, they're moving something, it costs them about uh, $3,000 a year. We know that that amount is going to go up exponentially. Now we apply the net present value formula to each of those years. And what it does, remember how much it was accumulating, how much the, the cost is, without the discounting, without the net present value formula, here's what it is with the net present value formula applied. Do you know what that means? Okay, take your hands and close your eyes. <laughs> That's what it means. You can't see the future anymore, and yet that is the answer you get using the mathematical equation for net present value that is in every economics book. And in fact, it's what I have to teach my students. This is what industry means by net present value, and this is how you calculate it. All right? So we have wiped out not only the future, but something that's silly about the future, something that's bad about the future, something that's good about the future. It doesn't matter. We're just not looking at it. Okay? So there's something wrong with this economics, and let's see how it is used, and you can understand the insanity here. Um, let's say that I've got my business, and it cost me $3,000 to move, move my cargo to my customers. Um, I'm thinking I want to make a change. I want to shift down my carbon emissions by 75%. So I'm going to figure out, I'm going to have my, my people do a project, and we're going to figure out how to take our car, cargo and put it onto the train. All right? That's going to cost some money to figure that out. We're going to have to package different. We're going to have to, you know, it's going to cost some money. So let's say it costs $50,000. We've still got our 2% inflation, but now I'm looking at a $2,000 savings. Yeah, all right. Um, the total cost, as I know from before, was uh, shy of half a million dollars. What's my total cumulative cost going into the future um, if I change the rail? Does it look like a good idea? Looks like a pretty good idea, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. Uh, why wouldn't I do this? What if I'm a company, um, uh, say I've got company A and company B. Company A decides, ah, I don't want to do it, right? I don't, uh, I'm going to just stay, stay the line, stay what I'm doing. Uh, and 20 years from now, their shipping costs are 6000 If I make this change, I make the investment and I make the change, 20 years from now, competition, change company, which one of them is still in business? If it's costing you three times as much to do the same thing, you, you've either changed like they have or you're not in business anymore. So there is actually an impetus for this transition. It's there, staring us in the face. It makes perfect sense, I reckon. But what does economics do to that? A discount rate of 10% is a very normal discount rate. I'm not using something silly. This is normal. Um, that $50,000 to change, I plug it into my formula, as I told you before, and we have already seen that the discounted net present value of that cost of shipping was $47,000. It costs more to make that change, according to the net present value formula. So I don't do it. The other reason I don't do it, uh, do you know what I mean by payback period? 
I spend $50,000 to make a change, and I save $2,000 a year. So the payback period is 20 years. I would never do that. We're looking for payback periods, you know, we've got to have two, three years, seven tops. So I'd never do that. So there's two economic indicators that tell me this transition to low carbon, lower cost, more competitive position is not a thing to do. If that seems like it doesn't make sense, you're correct, it does not make sense. That equation, that formula that everybody uses to make these decisions, to inform our decisions about what to do now for the future, to get financing, to convince the board, was never based on physics. It was never based on data. It was never based on, on anything. It is simply made up. And it didn't matter back in the day when it was made up because it didn't matter. Right? Who's going to hold you to account if you were wrong? <laughs> All right. <laughs> and besides that, I mean, the people we're talking about who do this, who give advice based on these things, are the same people that 2,000 years ago in Rome were pulling out entrails of chickens to decide. I mean, it's the same thing. <laughs> so don't expect it to make sense. It's, it's just, yeah. So guess what? Some time ago, I got interested in what would actual good advice looks like. Yeah? <laughs> well, it turns out I wasn't the only one. Um, there's a group of, there's some economists who've been um, looking at what might be wrong with current economic thinking. And one of my, one of my favorites is a guy named um, uh, Tim Jackson. He was the UK uh, chief economist for a while, and he's written a book Prosperity without growth, if you want to read it. And he comes to the conclusion that their equations miss something. <laughs> All right, what I've got here is a biodynamic model of human endeavor um, that we, we published some years ago. The green bit is the economy as the economists see it. Money goes around and around. You've got labor, capital, production, consumption. <laughs> the part they were missing is all of the energy, natural resources, and external impacts. Okay, that little bit. And uh, good old Tim Jackson reckons it's about 80% of the total economy they've been missing. And he doesn't know exactly what the formula should be in order to, count, in order to include that, but he thinks it might be a mistake. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, um, I don't really know how the rest of the economy works, but I do know it needs energy, consumer energy, something you can buy from the electric meter to do what you want to do. And it does need um, natural resources, and it needs somehow to deal with its waste. So I'm going to focus on that part. And the metric that I'm going to use is energy return on energy invested. And that is not quite as complicated as the formula. It's essentially energy profitability. P is the amount of energy produced by the energy sector that you can use. So it's the production. Um, S1 and S2 are the, um, are the types of energy that the, the energy sector takes from the economy. Um, coal mining requires diesel fuel. We could have used that diesel fuel for other things, for farming or for something else. But the, the coal miners need the diesel fuel to produce coal. Um, they also require equipment. And that has embedded energy in it, too. The economy could have used that equipment for something else. So if your energy sector is going to produce this benefit to society, it needs to be done at a profit. That's all we're saying here. And here's what is another factor that's really important. We said that the production from the, economy, uh, from the energy sector uh, compared to how much energy the energy sector used was an important metric. That's EROI. But also, what is the net energy to the economy? Because that's what we actually get to use to run the rest of the economy. What do we do with it? Well, we can consume it, uh, maintain what we've already built, and build new stuff. Okay? That's what we, what we can do with energy. So let's look at this a little bit. Um, coal is probably our highest energy return on energy investment. You need a little bit of diesel and a, and a truck and you can get a, one scoop of coal is a huge amount of energy. So it's not surprising that the Industrial Revolution grew out of coal, 
right? That, that was a great find, coal. You could do all sorts of things with it. Now, bituminous coal is a much higher EROI than lignite coal. You can see that. And you can see that the EROI is dropping in the U.S. Um, recently because they're starting to mine a lot more lignite to put that into the power plants. But it's dropping from 60 to 55. It, you know, it's a little drop, but it's still really good. Um, let's look at oil. Oil um, started off very high. All you have to do is drill a small hole, and it comes squirting out at you. And it only takes a little bit of energy to refine it into useful fuels. So the energy return on investment of oil is massive, and that's how we got last century, how we got this explosive growth, because we figured out how to use it, how to find it, how to pump it, how to refine it, and that's us. We are oil man. Now, this is the data for the United States. This is their production curve. They got to a peak in the 1970s and then have had a decline until the recent um, fracking boom. And so this is their production. And the EROI has been dropping. And if you look at it, there's a, a rather rapid drop about the time they started trying to make up for this decline with the Alaska oil, which has a much lower EROI. Um, and with offshore oil, which again, much lower return on investment. Why? Oil's still the same, but you have to put in so much more energy to get it. All right, so that's hopefully making sense. And what doesn't make sense is going fracking <laughs> because the return on investment is so low. In fact, that's not even a monetarily profitable industry. It's just a thing they're doing. Um, the tar sands is diabolical in more ways than one, but in energy prosperity. It's one of those stupid things we shouldn't do. All right. Um, here's a nice map of the energy return on investment of different types of energy um, resources, energy conversion systems. And if we look at the, um, uh, what I've mapped out here is actually energy profit margin. That net, what the economy gets to use from it, produced by its energy sector, compared to basically how big the energy sector is, what's it producing? And that profitability, if you have a very high profitability, you have prosperity. This is where you want to be, is in prosperity. If you can just get by, but you can't build a new library, you can't fix your highways, you can't maintain your bridges, you can't build back the things that fall down, that's subsistence. Yeah, you can't afford to paint your house. It's like that. And so we don't really want to be in this area, and we certainly don't want to decline. That's where you, you don't, not only do you not have uh, money for growth or for, for maintenance, you have to reduce your, your demand as well. So let's look at these for a second. What are our high profitability energies? Well, they're hydro. New Zealand, lucky you. <laughs> Got some hydro. Um, thermal coal, like we said, that's what caused the Industrial Revolution. Conventional oil, that's us. Um, conventional gas, we're now very happily burning that like crazy. And gas combined cycle, not too bad. Notice this one, please, the orange line. That's some of the highest energy return on investment we have today, by far. You want more energy. You think, does anybody here think we need more energy? In fact, we don't, not at all. We need to quit wasting what we've got. We need this one, conservation and efficiency. We don't need any more energy, so there we are. Um, but if we add more energy to the mix, it's gonna be over in this area, some wind, um, that gas combined cycle, and that's a little bit less profitable, but still pretty good. Where we probably wanna think hard about going is into, um, into this area. Uh, well, we already have. Turning coal into electricity just does so many useful things. But um, it, you take a big hit on what your EROI is from using it for heat. But where we really don't want to go is over there because it's not profitable. We really can't do much but subsist. And if we push over into things which we should not do, we are going to decline because our energy sector is going to use more energy than it produces and it will drag on the entire economy. There'll be this thing munching away at our energy budget and not doing anything for us. That's insane. Yeah, all right. And this is carbon capture and storage. This is hydrogen, using hydrogen for anything. And this is battery storage, all right? So you can do these, question is, should you? And I would say if you want an economy, if you want a society, the answer is no. Do some of this. <laughs> All right, that's a little hard to absorb. 
because our story says hydrogen, right? Our minister says hydrogen. All right, well, let's, uh, let's tell ourselves another story. Low-hanging fruit is a story that extractors understand. If you had a very high ore grade over there and you had a low ore grade over there, you'd be using that one. <laughs> Right, low-hanging fruit. It's a very easy concept. And we're going to use this parable of low-hanging fruit to understand when it's worth it. Because that's what we need to know right now. At this point of transition, we need to know what is worth doing. All right, let's say you've got a nice apple tree all full of lovely apples. And you can sit in your chair and reach up and get an apple. One calorie worth of energy to reach up, 45 calories returned. Good ROI, yes? In fact, the ROI is so good that you can afford to just take a bite out of an apple and chuck it over your shoulder and reach up and get another one. There's plenty. We're never going to run out. How could you eat a whole tree's worth of apples? Eh? All right. That's uh, 150 years ago. That's what the world was like. All right. We can afford to discount the future. At the time that the economists were coming up with their ideas, that's the world they were in. All right. Let's say that you want more than just apples. Apples and cheese go really good together. I hope you all have had your dinner. Apples and cheese go really good together. And maybe a little wine. Well, buy a basket, spend an hour or two picking apples, carry them to the farmer's market, and sell them. Spend a couple hours selling them. Hopefully, you'll make enough to pay back your basket, pay yourself a little bit of wage, and buy some cheese. Fair enough? And next week, if you uh, filled up two baskets worth, well, you might need a helper. So you employ somebody for a few hours to help you pick, help you carry the apples, help you sell them. Uh, you can pay off that basket, pay the worker. You've now created jobs. There's lots of apples. People are starting to buy your apples to make pies and cider. And it's all going pretty well. And we now have an economy. Huh? All right. Um, demand grows. And you could plot that. And you could go, oh, here we are. Demand is growing. Uh, but we get to the point where you can't reach the apples anymore. And so now you're at a decision point. Time to get out decision-making tools. Because are you going to buy a ladder? The ladder is way more expensive than the basket. But you have to buy the ladder in, any, in order to get any more apples. Yeah? So you're kind of stuck. You've got to buy the ladder. But it'll probably take you three or four loads of apples of about the same volume. You can't increase volume because you bought the ladder. You can only keep going. So it'll probably take three or four loads to pay back that ladder. And so you've got, you got to start cutting back. And now you need your worker just to hold the ladder to keep you safe. So he's not actually being productive because you had to go up higher. You see where I'm getting at? Is where do you stop? How do you... How do you know what to do? Because the economy's been growing and the mayor is not happy with the idea that you might slow down apple production because the guys have already invested in, in ovens to make pies and tourists are coming. And the mayor has, has used tax money to build a nice picnic area for people to have their pies. You can't just stop the economy. We're in a pickle here because it's not the time to be silly. There are new technologies. There are technologies that can let us get up there and get the apples that we need. Yes? All right. <laughs> really? You know, take more risks. Go into unmanageable debt for the last apple. That's what carbon capture and sequestration is. That's what hydrogen is. That's what wave energy is. That's what biofuels are. That's what I mean by Silly stuff. We can talk about it. We can talk about what color of green paint we want on our cherry picker. We can imagine it. We can say, oh, wouldn't it be good if we could have that? We could say, well, the government should subsidize it because we need the apples. And yet it would still be the wrong thing to do. And it's so wrong that we probably won't do it. But we could spend, we could waste time talking about it. Now, what we can afford to do and what conventional economics would agree is the right thing to do is to spend not nearly as much money as a cherry picker but to buy a chainsaw. There's another way to get those apples. And if the future doesn't matter then that's perfectly logical. 
And this is where the protesters come in. If you're not out there in front of that guy protesting cutting down the tree, you haven't been paying attention. <laughs> right? So when somebody's going to do something irrevocable, um, irreplaceable, self-destructive, even if economics says it's okay, that's when it's a really good time to protest. And so this is what we're talking about with fracking. That's, that's the sort of thing we should be protesting. Deep sea drilling, coal bed methane, tar sands. Get out there and stop them. The economists can't figure it out. Somebody has to. All right, so in this new perspective, which I promised you, hopefully you understand that there are these decision points where we've gone too far and we're not making sense anymore and we don't really know what to do. We do need a new perspective. It turns out that profitability being sustained, sustaining prosperity, sustaining profitability, and sustaining productivity are really the only things we have to do. We, we can't actually do anything without doing that because the transition to zero carbon has to be profitable or it won't happen. It's just a fact. So protest what's stupid, but understand that whatever it is that's going to have to happen, it has to be done at a profit. Your best charity, Wise Response, can't operate at no profit. You still have to pay the bills. <laughs> All right. So the new perspective is this. Um, the carbon extraction sector gets together, and they do a new thing, and it's called futurizing. Okay? Now, this uh, is where they transition engineer their options and figure out what they're going to do. And here's what they're going to do, according to me. It was my idea. I gave them for free. The carbon sector gets together and it says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We are going to set, because the IPCC and the IEA and the OECD all say, they all conclude that you need at least a $250 per ton carbon price in order to be able to even reduce carbon emissions and have a chance at getting to 1.5 degrees. And so to, in order to make that transition, we are going to impose that carbon price on our goods. We're going to work with the government to make sure that all imports also get charged that carbon price. And we're going to let the, the economy know when those prices are going to go in. So maybe we, we um, do the first lot of carbon price one year, then the next year, and then the next year. So it's ratcheting up, and we'll get to that 250 within a few years. And everyone will know what the price is going to be. If everyone knows that we need a carbon price of at least $250 a ton in order for us to have a chance of getting anywhere near the targets we've set, how many of you think your politicians are going to put that on? Not a one of you. If the carbon companies have to make massive changes in order to figure out how to reduce their production and it has to be done at a profit, why shouldn't they put the carbon price on? Collect that money, change what they're doing, and figure out new things to invest in. And then they're going to tell you how much their reduction in, in production they're going to make. And they're going to map it out for you so that you know how much less fuel there's going to be for your Fonterra factories, how much less fuel there's going to be. Uh, he's shaking his head. You're going to tell the carbon companies what to do? <laughs> they pretty much get free reign. Because what you might not understand is that they have those silly things they've been doing. If they cut those back, their profitability would go up. So why wouldn't they do the thing the protesters wanted them to do, which is stop what they're doing? There's a way that that happens. And that's that they do it. Now, they would need to fix the coal, oil, and gas price so that it doesn't fluctuate around. So they would also need to do a kind of syndicate monopoly so that everybody knows what the price is going to be for coal, oil, and gas. And if you knew what it was going to be, you would be able to do all of the engineering and all of the changes which we all say with our mouths we should do because we'd have that price, and we'd know we're now under a constraint.
there's going to be less fuel, and it's time to get busy with all those things we said we were going to do. And that means there's going to be an emergence of transition industries and an emergence of regenerative industries, and there's a big industry with money to put into those enterprises. <laughs> and they start making a shift. Because your extraction industries have a lot of heavy engineering capabilities, and they could build trams, and they could build light rail, and they could build railroads, and they could build the things that we need in our low carbon economy, like I just showed you with the example of the freight movement. All right? So, all we've gotta do is get on with that, use good information, don't waste time, and don't do dumb things, and the protesters can help you out with that. I'm willing to help because I believe in getting on with it, and that's why I am starting the Futurize Initiative. It's a transition engineering coalition of some of the top industrial universities uh, in the world, and we have uh, one of those at Canterbury, and we actually have experience working with cities and big industries from around the world on how they transition to low carbon. That's all I've got to say. <laughs> well, there's food for thought. <laughs> and uh, lots of issues, lots of questions. Very much looking to the future. Can I ask Nick to come out and uh, take a seat? And uh, I think Sue and Graham were going to uh, distribute speakers as we need them. First, first economics talk I've actually understood. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in knowing in, in, in how much of your pitch to industry is taking hold. Is there a willingness or are we uh, naively f and foolishly waiting? Well, picture me making this song today. Oh yeah, he did a good job of holding it up. Maybe you could repeat the question. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, the question was, so how did it go? <laughs> okay, well here's how it went. Um, I finished that and there was sort of this, wait a minute. Okay, and then uh, they did a clapping, and then <laughs> I went out the back, and a bunch of people followed me, and, uh, and they said, we want to talk to you about that, and I didn't get one negative response. I, I heard wheels turning, right? Okay, do you think we can meet in the middle on this somewhere? So yeah, it went, it went pretty well, and I'm going back tomorrow, thanks guys, um, <laughs> to sit on the panel about, uh, about coal, what to do about coal. So I don't know what to do about coal, but uh, I have an idea. So. <laughs> tomorrow a forum. It's a forum. It's a forum. Woman first. Uh, kia ora. Um, my name's Jo. I'm from Middlemarch. <laughs> um, I've been living there off and on um, since I was eight years old. And um, it's sad that Daphne can't talk tonight. Um, but I just wanted to not ask a question but have an invitation uh, for you all to come to her to talk at the um, Strathtyre Community Hall on the 15th of June. Um, which is a Saturday between 1 and 3, um, if you'd like to hear her talk. Um, I appreciate the environment there and the stillness and the beauty of the country, and it would be really great if you can come up and support us. Thank you. Questions? That was excellent, Susan. Thank you. The $250 a tonne is so fundamental to fixing the problems. Our problem is the big voter block that won't go anywhere near it in the opposition to them. How do we take them on that journey? Can we talk All more right. about the way they're living with this great subsidy? We need to inform them 
and maybe take a whole province like the West Coast that denies there's any climate change from humans and block the past with Extinction Rebellion and make them think about what it's like to deny science and leave the world. How do we take that great public along to accept the carbon tax when even a capital gains is off the, off the agenda? Right. Well, um, uh, if, you, if you couldn't hear it, he says, how do you take the public along on this journey? And I solved that problem. It doesn't matter. Right? If, if the carbon companies do it, you really? But that's, you know, they're handing the thing that we want to them on a plate. It, yeah? How do, you, how do you argue with getting what you wanted? <laughs> and so, you know, I don't know. Like, like I, I think it's the one way to get it done. Because politically, it's nearly untenable, as you say. You, you, you can't convince people to do what they're asking you to do. Funny enough. Um, so this, this, this interesting hitch of having, having the oil companies collect the carbon price and use the money to do the transition, which, by the way, they were all talking about today. The, 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 this, the number of times that someone in the extractive industry said, and we're at a point of transition, I, I thought was quite, quite amazing. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I'm quite impressed by the power of the extractive industries, the power they have um, to do what they what they wish to do, um, and so I've I've in my little scenario I've given them that that power. I, you know, if they if they could figure out how to do it, then it would probably get done. <laughs> oh, and we could use some work with psychologists anyway, because it's not. Um, it's not just the people. I mean, the people, we're going to need marketers, we're going to need sociologists, we're going to, we're going to need to understand the ramifications of the thing we're talking about doing, and we're going to have to understand how fast we have to build the alternatives for people who won't be able to afford the higher price. Uh, you know, that, that there's, there's a lot of transition engineering goes into that. Where the more, uh, Currently, there's one, I guess you call it a discipline, um, 